Uh, our next speaker is uh, uh, Ramon Brasfugo. He's associate professor uh, of Chicano Latino studies here in Berkeley. Uh, but uh, I would say that uh, Ramon was one of the early individuals to jump into research on Islamophobia, uh, sponsoring one of the first conferences, getting every, every one of us out to France, Paris, which was good. Uh, for us to begin discussing Islamophobia a few years before it actually came here in the United States. Uh, so his contribution to Islamophobia is really very monumental and has been interested in the subject from the get-go. Uh, on the other issue also, just for us, we have about 61 individuals that are joining us online right now. So we actually have a live webcast with, across the country and we're actually take questions from them at, when we begin the question and answer period. So Ramon. Please. Thank you, Hatari. Uh, I really uh, want to thank you for uh, putting together this fascinating panel. Uh, and I would like to say to my previous speaker, I wonder what the Rand Corporation will say about uh, the Sufis in, in Fallujah. They were the ones resisting and fighting American forces on the ground. So I wonder what will they say about the Sufis in Fallujah. People don't know this, but the majority of the people on the ground fighting the American forces in Iraq in Fallujah were Sufi Muslims. Uh, same thing, I wonder what would they say about the Chechenians fighting the Russian Empire. Sufi Muslims, okay? And the same thing I will say about the resistance movement today in Afghanistan, where a great number of them are also Sufi Muslims. So uh, this teach about Sufi Muslims is also, uh, you know, uh, uh, used in a very, uh, in a very uh, distorted way. And the other thing I want to say is that I wonder what the rank, I mean, the rank of corporations talking about, you know, criticizing. Uh, Islamic feminism use the Quran as a source of uh, women's liberation. But what is sad, what is sad, is that most of the white left share this position. You see, and this is sad to hear the white left repeating Rand Corporation ultra right wing things, you know, uh, like this. Like, okay, if you are a, a, a feminist, you have to be a Western feminist. Otherwise, you're not a feminist. This is the way the, the left also thinks, okay? So let's put things in context here. It's not only the right wingers, it's also the left mm -hmm. who is also caught in these problems. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, the same thing with the good Muslim, bad Muslim. If you happen to be a Muslim, you know, I mean, a Muslim belief in the Quran and the Word of God, there's no way out, you know? So uh, you, you, you will find the same thing the right corporation is saying, uh, you will find the same rhetoric coming from the left, the right left in this country, who shares these same premises. Okay, so, and the, the problem is that they're sharing a, a, what I will be describing here as racism, okay, and epistemic racism. Okay? If you look at what's happening today in Western Europe and the US as central core metropolitan centers in the capitalist world economy, you will see that the same things that we're seeing today going on and emerging in, as Islamophobic uh, discourses, violence against Muslims, this has been going on in Europe, okay, for a while now. Islamophobia sells both, okay? It, it sells both. So you have today, in Western Europe, a lot of political parties moving very fast into Islamophobic discourses. So you have all these crazy debates every you know, going on about the law against the veil, the law against the burqa, the law against you know all kinds of stuff coming up as a major uh, uh, discourse and, and as a major uh, uh, you know kind of uh, uh, massive uh, uh, discrimination against Muslims in Western Europe today that are now replayed here in America. And I, I ask myself, if there is some kind of looking at each other 
in what they're doing. Because, you know, I wonder, the same way we look at each other in our struggles for liberation, and we read the people who are thinking in decolonial ways everywhere, they do the same thing. So I'm sure that the wilders, you know Wilder in, in the Netherlands, he just put one third of the votes that won the elections with one third of the votes in the Netherlands in early June with an Islamophobic discourse. Completely Islamophobic. It's going on, this is going on all over Western Europe, in England, in France, in Spain, in, in the Netherlands, in Germany, all over the place. Okay? And now this is uh, uh, increasingly uh, coming to America. Now, the question is, is this coming to America or is this being here in America? Right? And I think it's been here for a long time. Okay? The question is that something happened that triggered these things. Okay? But Islamophobia has been here for a long time. It's not new. Okay? What happened is that now it becomes very visible and it becomes very overt in its uh, expressions. Okay? But it's been here. So, uh, the, the, the question I would like to ask is a question that is debated in Europe today and that I'm sure is debated today in the US, which is, and this has to do with the second part of the title of this conference, the critical race theory. Is Islamophobia a form of racism or is Islamophobia just a form of religious discrimination? Okay? Now, my point, the point I want to raise is that I think Islamophobia is a form of racism. If you go to, the, to Europe today, a lot of Europeans, even left-wing uh, Europeans, will use all kinds of uh, politically correct arguments, like the question of feminism, like the question of all kinds of questions, uh, to justify Islamophobic discourse and discrimination. Even the left, you see that from the right to the left, where they're now making, I mean, you never heard people there defending feminism in such a strong way, you know, over there. And the same thing happened here. You never heard, you know, political elites of this country defending feminism on there. They have to invade Afghanistan and they have to find a, you know, a way of, of, of justifying the, the invasion. So they suddenly Bush, George Bush became a feminist. So all these things are going on in a very, very crazy way because what is happening is in the use of a feminist rhetoric, they are covering up racist, Islamophobic discourses and discrimination against Muslims. And so the whole thing gets confused because you have people from the right to the left reproducing the same thing okay, and using so-called progressive rhetoric to then homogenize the whole population, put everybody into a label, everybody's patriarchal in the Muslim world, there's no way out. Okay? So you, you fall into a, a, a orientalist discourse where you froze people in time and put all these labels, one after the other, in the name of the so-called progressive rhetoric. And you see that in the white left, and you see that in the, in the, in the right wings, okay? All over, Western Europe, all the way to the US, okay? Now, the problem is, what do we mean by racism? This, I think, is the main question, because I think there is a lot of confusion about what is exactly this term about. And I want to hold to the definition used in, uh, by Franz Fanon. Franz Fanon used a very interesting definition that uh, Caribbean Afro philosophers have been developing over the years, like Sylvia Winter, like Nelson Maldonado Torres, like Louis Gordon, like Pilot Henry, where the question for Fanon is the question of the dividing line between people who are classified as part of the zone of being. And by being, he means people whose humanity is recognized. Even if within that category there are conflicts and contradictions, okay? And then you put a line below the word being, and you put below that another word, which is the zone of non-being, okay? Non-being is a different zone for Fanon, because the zone of non-being for Fanon is the zone of people whose humanity is not recognized, or whose humanity is not uh, taken as such. Okay? So the, the question of racism 
is a question about a hierarchy of superiority inferiority where the dividing line okay, of the people on top of the line in, in the zone of being whose existence is recognized and acknowledged even if there are conflicts okay, inside that zone. Okay, and, and these people in the zone of being are considered superior while people below the line of humanity in the zone of non-being are considered inferior Okay? And in this zone of non-being, you have a multiplicity of groups and people whose humanity is put below the line of the human. That is, they are subhuman or non-human. So, part of what happened in the debates about racism is that people confuse the form that racism takes with racism as such. What I mean by that is that if you think about racism, as a hierarchy of superiority inferiority, okay? And you think about in the, in the Fanonian sense, okay? Where people, there's some people whose humanity, whose subjectivity, whose, uh, they, are, they are recognized, and people in the zone of non-being whose humanity is not recognized, whose subjectivity is not recognized, okay? Then you start seeing that in the zone of being, you have certain categories, that apply there, which are the categories of civil rights, uh, law, regulation, etc., where if there is a conflict, it's always regulated through some form of a, a, a legal thing as a norm or as a trend. It's always regulated this way. While in the zone of non being, those laws, even if people are former citizens, those laws do not apply in the same way. And where the trend in the regulation with this population in the zone of non-being is what Vanon calls in the zone of non-being a uh, people whose everyday life is regulated through violence. Okay? And here is where and here the question of citizenship do not apply. Okay? Because you could be a citizen and still be put in the category of non-being, and then you your everyday life is going to be a life of violence, of confronting violence. And this is a, so the question is that usually we confuse the form racism takes with the content. That is, there are places like in America where the form of racism has historically been marked <coughs> through the question of color. Okay? There are other places in the world where racism is not marked through color. That is marked through ethnicity, or through religion, or through other means and other ways, okay? And I'm saying this because many people will feel politically correct to be Islamophobe using progressive rhetoric, and you have a, a lot of white left reproducing this form, okay? using pro progressive rhetoric to justify Islamophobia. Okay? But then, the problem is that uh, in, in using this kind of category, they will say they're not racist because they think that to be racist is to be a colon racist. But if you take the Fanonian definition of racism, of a hierarchy of superiority inferiority on the line of the human, where the people in the superior side are considered part of the of being whose existence is acknowledged and recognized. And people in the inferior side as part of the zone of non-being where violence is an everyday thing. Okay? If you take that definition, then the way you mark that hierarchy will be done through many ways. It could be done through color, like in the history of the United States, or it could be done through religion, or it could be done through ethnicity, or it could be done through, through language. 